with Mauro. I decided to give a, a, an overview of, the, of what to do when you have some performance problem in a your closure project, how to detect the problem, how to, how to improve performance. So this is what this talk will be about. It's not super deep, it's mostly an overview of all the possible uh, solutions, so you can investigate more on your own. Okay. So suppose you have a, a closure system in production, and and you have a, a and you have to improve performance, right? So what's the first thing you do? You find the bottleneck, right? Before that, you shouldn't jump straight into finding the, the bottleneck and trying to optimize. It, it is super fun to optimize and tune the code and, and extract milliseconds. But, but if, you're, well, if it's just your hobby project, it's fine, because you're doing it for fun anyway. But if you're doing it professionally, it's very likely that you should not be optimizing this. Uh, even if you know that there is some part of your code that's not optimal, it's it's very likely that you bring more value to your business if you implement some other feature instead of reducing from 30 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds some 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 endpoint that almost never runs, right? So first, make sure that you really want to optimize that it's worth the, the effort, and, and also if it is sometimes it is already super fast so. Makes like even if you make it ten times faster, it was super fast to begin with. So making it faster is not is not making it noticeably faster, depending on the, the application, right? Okay, so suppose you really have a problem. So you, you decided that you have to optimize. You have to uh, find the, the the code that is using the biggest uh, chunk of your, your CPU, right? the biggest part of the, the time. How that is the process that we call profiling. So th there are some tools for that. Th there is one uh, closure specific tool, uh, this uh, called Timbre, that, we, that I, I've used a couple of times before. I think it's pretty useful and, and easy to use. And there are some general JVM tools like Visual VM and YourKit. I think YourKit is free to use for open source projects, but paid for commercial projects. Visual VM, I don't know if it's the same thing. Timber is, is free to use. Uh, uh, Timber was um, a logging library that also includes some profiling features. And now, like, some time ago, it was split into two different libraries. So. That's why I put the parentheses. So now the profiling part is in the new library. For for benchmarking to uh, to know how long each, if you have just one snippet of code, you can run uh, using one of these two functions. So there's a very easy, convenient function. It's time is in the Closure standard library. You just run, just wrap your your block of code with this with a call to the time function, and it will return the same thing. So it won't affect the result of your program, but it will print to standard out the the time it took to run. The problem is, it is very inconsistent. Not because time is wrong, but because of many particularities of the JVM. So, for example, the, the JIT compiler, the just-in-time compiler, it will make the second run much faster than the, the first run in, in your function, in the function call. So, if you run with time twice in a row, you, you, or if you run once and think it's slow, and then you make some change and run again, you say, ah, it's much faster. But it's not because of your change. It might be because some, uh, some sub, uh, sub like some other function that is invoked by your program was optimized by the just-in-time compiler. And there are so many uh, pitfalls that, uh, that, that the, someone decided to create this library called Criterium to avoid all of these pitfalls, so I really recommend to use that. You only use time if it 
because it's super convenient and if you just want to have a rough estimate of, of how long it takes. Okay, now suppose you have found the, the part of the code that you want to optimize. So what do you do? There are closure specific things to do and there are uh, more general principles from software programming that could be applied to any, any language, right? So first of all, uh, the, the first thing you should think of is if there's a better algorithm to solve the problem. There is no micro-optimization that will make a bigger impact than changing the big O complexity. If you have like a, an N to the third or fourth and you reduce to N to N squared, it will be make everything much faster than if you make a lower level optimization. I'm sure you can come up with some exceptions to this. So th that's another thing that's very tricky with optimization. Uh, I will make a, a series of recommendations of things that you can change to make it run faster. And they won't always make it faster. So you should always change and uh, profile again to see if it really made it faster. Sometimes it's co counterintuitive. Um, even if you have a good algorithm with a good complexity, make sure that what you implemented is really uh, what it's supposed to, to, to be. Sometimes you, you know that one algorithm solves a problem, you open the, the Wikipedia page and you see the, the complexity and you think that that's what is implemented in your code, but, but due to some mistake, it, that's not what is running. I've seen this happen more than once. So make sure that you're not uh, traversing a, a sequence multiple times by mistake. And, and make sure that you're using the right data structure. Uh, if you want to look up by index, make sure you have a vector that you are not use, getting the, the <coughs> nth ele element in a sequence so that would traverse multiple times. Only after all, all the, uh, only after you have thought of all of these algorithmic changes, if nothing nothing can solve your problem, then you start to think of more specific implementation details, more like closure specific things. So, usually we write iteration with map reduce filter or uh, with a for the list compression. They are very readable, very nice to use but they are often not the, the fastest way to run the code. So if you are doing this in the, the part of the code that you have decided to optimize, you could try. First, if you're using my produce filter, try to use four and vice versa. Sometimes the difference is significant, like 20% or something. You can also try a loop recur. If you do a... a a loop, you, you won't generate intermediate uh, intermediate values, like you won't have uh, laziness, so it might be much faster because of that. It, you won't use the, yeah, if, if you just do a normal recursion, you might grow the, the, the stack, so it could uh, cause a stack overflow, or it could take longer to run just because it's allocating all, all the time. If you, if you do, loop, if you do a, call, a tail call, tail recursion, with either with loop recur or just using recur to call the same function, then it, it doesn't grow the stack and it's supposed to run faster. If you have something like mutual recursion, then loop recur won't work. You have to use trampolines, which are, so I, I don't think I will cover that in detail now, but instead of returning the value, you change the function to return a function that like a thunk that is a function that has no arguments that returns the value. It's not, a, it's, it's not really hard to make this change and then you won't consume the stack. So that might help. If not, not nothing of that uh, solves the problem, you can consider uh, 
other data structures. So you can use transients. Does anybody know what they are? Like, who, has anybody used in production or something? It is. You have. Okay. So, so I'll explain briefly. So transients basically. Um, They, they make the structures, there are different types of data structure that, that is not uh, immutable, like the, the other closure ones. So when you make one change, uh, a SOC or a count, it destroys the old one. So it gives you a new one with the change that you, that you made, but it destroys the old one. So it's kind of like changing in place. Uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of closure, so you have to use it uh, with, like, like carefully. Uh, since it, it changes somewhat in place, it is much faster. But d don't pass it around. Don't don't uh, don't write one function that expects a transient as an argument or don't, uh, that has a, that as a as a return value. So if you if you are, for example, if you are generating one one huge vector you want to pre-populate, you can create one function that that receives like, no arguments or the size of this vector or something and returns the vector. If you only create the transient in this function and then uh, transform it into the persistent version, then it then it's fine because the, the, the damage is very self-contained. It's only in that function that something can go wrong, but you're not changing how the rest of the, the, the project sees the, uh, the data structure. Right. Another thing you can do is, since Java interrupt is so easy, you can use the Java data structures and then it's the mutation in place. So use with care, but sometimes it's what you have to do. They're, they're faster. Uh, we all love immutable data structures. They're super easy, convenient, but there, there's a price we pay to use them. Right. depending on the, the problem domain, um, you, you might make use of parallelism. So the, the first thing you, you can think of is PMAP, simply because it it's not super powerful, it doesn't help that, that frequently, but it's so easy to make the change. You just type one character more, and sometimes your program becomes much faster. You, you can use all the cores in your processor. So keep that in mind, because when it's possible to use it, it's really worth it. It's super easy. You can use reducers, which also help with running in parallel. So if you have a normal reduce, depending on the, the properties of your, your problem, you can use reducers. You can start uh, normal JVM threads doing interop. So you can manually coordinate them if you want, if PMAP doesn't solve the, your use case. You can use agents with our, uh, are not as manual as calling the, uh, instantiate the threads, but they are also a bit tricky. Uh, they can introduce uh, bugs in your code, so use with care again. Okay, a new, uh, another trick. You can, uh, you, you should avoid Java, uh, like JVM reflection, right? So JVM uh, the reflection is when you pass, uh, uh, when you look up the method of an object that you want to call by, by name. You pass it, uh, a string to some Java function uh, to, to do, to retrieve the, the method, and then you call the method passing some arguments. But this lookup by name is much, much slower than calling the, the actual function directly. In, in our case, in, in closure, it, it is usually when you're, when you're doing uh, interrupt, so open parenthesis, dot, uh, and some method of some object, then it will uh, be converted automatically to this lookup by name. So if, if, you, if you call this uh, set worn on reflection true, every time there is a, 
there's a, a reflective uh, lookup, Closure will print a, a warning. So you, you will know that you're doing something uh, not optimally. It's not, it's not hard to do, but take a look at the documentation. You should put, so when you detect that you're doing a reflection, you, you have to use, you have to provide type hints. So you mark that one, one argument or your function or the return value of the function is of a certain type. And to do that, you have to put metadata. And the metadata must be in the symbol, not in the value itself. So it, it's a bit tricky. But it's, it's not hard once you learn how to do it. Just make sure that you, you're putting the metadata in, in the argument, not the value itself. I can, I can show you an example if you have time. If you are doing some number crunching, so again, it's specific to your problem domain, but for in some cases, there are many things you can try. And those things are also uh, not trivial. So there are many libraries that help, help us with that. So well, well, one thing without libraries, you can avoid uh, boxed objects. So in, like in, in Java, you would use lowercase int instead of the object integer with capital I. Um, in, in Clojure, there are some functions that help create, for example, int array. It returns the int array for you instead of an array of objects. And there are um, many, so the, the libraries that can, can help. So core matrix is, if, if you're doing matrix operations, matrix multiplication, it, it helps uh, you with that, helps with avoiding uh, boxed objects. There are these other libraries that they, they can run on the G GPU, the graphics card, like, like CUDA and, and CL. Like, you, you can take a look at the, these these libraries, uh, but but again, it's not for every use case. Like it's very uh, a very small subset of your problems that you can run in the GPU. Uh, so w another thing you can do is uh, always keep in mind that you can move one level down in the uh, hierarchy of like abstractions. So if you, you, you write most of your business logic in Clojure because it's nice and convenient, but when you want to optimize, you can write one library in Java and export the jar and just call the jar, the one function from that jar. Uh, because it's convenient to call from Clojure and it will run much faster. It can be optimized by the compiler. If that is not enough, we can use G J and A, J and I, which are closer to calling, uh, to running like C code from Java. So you can have one, one chain of, of levels. You can go down a few levels. I've never had to use J and A or J and I in a closure project. I think, like personally, I think that if you have to go that down, you probably shouldn't have started from closure. You have a, such a specific use case that you, you really need the, the very best performance. So you probably shouldn't have started with closure from to begin with. And that's it for the slides. We can we can see the something some source code if you want, like the the reflection warnings. Ah oh, yes, the problem is that I can't. I can't see from here. Can I try to change this? Can you read the code in the editor? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so to use the Tuft library, that is the, the profiling library that was extracted from the logging library, you, you just import this line and call this function in the beginning. And then if you have some block of code here, you, you can wrap some of those, like uh, this is the range, you, you wrap them in a call to this p macro. You do this, this. And then when you want to call here, you call profile. Bottom map uh, first argument in here. Yes. Okay. Good. Then it prints uh, the number of calls to each of the of these things. So you, you give it an identifier and it tells you the number of calls and and how long each call uh, took, like the minimum, maximum, average. So you, you can do this in your, your server in production without changing anything. Like it still returns the, the same, uh, same same return value. So you can make this change in production in some parts of the code or in some simulation of production. Doesn't matter. Factorial example. It is what I, I, I mentioned briefly. If mm, so, if you have a factorial of a number, if the number is, is at most, if it's zero or one, return one. Otherwise, return the number times the factorial of like x minus one. Right. This is the basic re uh, recursive method, recursive way to write it. Uh, if you want to know how, uh, like the performance of it, you can just wrap the the call. So, for example, here the, the call. Okay. If I just call this, you get the 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 result, right? So, if I call with this quick branch around it, it will take a while. It is running. You can see here in the bottom. It, it it runs the, the, uh, my so this quick branch which comes from a criterion runs my function multiple times. That's why it takes long, it takes from ten seconds to one minute depending on your function. Okay, while well, it's running, uh, let's see the other ones. So I, I rewrote, ah, okay, good. Evaluation count, so it ran, uh, so you can see all the number of, uh, of calls, samples, the, all the execution time, the mean, uh, yeah. All, so I usually just take a look at the, the mean, but, but some people want to know how, like, if it varies a lot, so from like the minimum to maximum, all these things. <laughs> okay, the, the idea was to show that if you use an accumulator and you convert it to a tail call, it doesn't take as uh, as long to run. But we can we can skip this because it took longer than I wanted. Um, here is an example of how to create the unbox the arrays. So if you have like this range, if you call to array, it re it creates a. So this is the type, and uh, the representation of the type uh, that the JVM gives. So it's a an array of objects. If you call the, the same range, if you call into array instead of to array. Oops. 
it returns uh, an array of longs. No, it's no longer objects. Now it's an array of longs. And if you use int array, it returns an array of int. It's not uh, longs or anything. So this, in theory, I guess, should be faster to run. But you can, as I, as I said, you should, you should experiment. Mm, for reflection, so the thing is, suppose we have this, like one big string here, right? So this is the contents of the string. Like, it doesn't matter, it's just one, one string. If you have one function that gets the, the bytes from this string, Right, so if I call like here f some string, it's returning some byte array, okay? But this dot get bytes, this is the, the reflection, uh, the reflective call. So what it is doing is it's similar to calling this, let's see. So like if you start from the value and you get call reflect and get the members, this is what Closure is doing under the hood when you call this dot get bytes. Get bytes here, you see in the bottom that there are five results. And these results have different uh, signatures. So the return type here is a byte. So it has no parameters. It's just a string and returns uh, the, the byte array. But there is another, uh, another variation of another implementation of this uh, method that receives the byte array as a, a parameter and returns void, like nothing. So how does it know which one to call? Well, in this case, it's just by the number of parameters, but there might, the, 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 the implementations could, could be different only by the, the type of parameter. So it would have to go over all these implementations if you're calling by reflection. It would have to go over all of these to figure out which one matches the types of the arguments you give. That's why it, it is slow. If you turn this on, if you turn this uh, Warner reflection true, now when you call this function, when you define the function f, you will get this uh, reflection warning. Uh, reference to field get bytes can be resolved. So it doesn't know which of those functions it should call. How do you solve that? If you define the function this way, so if you put this string metadata in, in the argument, now, now the closure compiler knows that it is a string. So you, you see that when I define here, I don't get the warning. So I, there's no reflection call, no. I ran this before, uh, benchmark with the first version with uh, reflection. It took 11 <coughs> microseconds. And without reflection, took like half the time. So, it, it, considering that it is a very small change, like it, sometimes it's hard to know where exactly you want to, you, want, you have to make the change, but it's not super hard, and like, and the improvement is significant too. It's a good trick to do. I have some examples with PMAP that I mentioned. So you have like a basic, uh, like a function that is expensive to compute. But in, in my, my example, I just put a sleep for one second to pretend that it took one second to compute something. And you want to do, you're doing like five times and getting the results of all of those. So if you do with map and now using the time function, as I said before, I run this, it should take five seconds because it's doing uh, in sequence. So it took five seconds to compute this one for each of those. If I ju change, I just insert one character here. Now it is pmap. When I run again, it takes one second to run for all five because I have more than five cores. And here the, the, the transitions that I mentioned. Okay, suppose that we have uh, just run this reduce. So you see we're we are creating one map from from one number to the same number for all numbers in a sequence, right? So zero to zero, one to one. 
and this could be one way you would write. And I chose this way because it's the one that maps directly to the, the transient version. So you, instead of using a, a persistent, here we're talking to the persistent uh, immutable map. Instead of that, if, if you call transient into the empty map and change a sock to a sock bank, so it's the destructible version, the, the, like the version that changes the argument. And by the end of it, when you finish running everything, you call persistent again to convert to the, the, the persistent map. The first version, the, the normal way to write, would take 91 milliseconds, and the, the version with transients took like one third of the time. So sometimes it's a, it's a good improvement. Uh, before writing this way, you might try with four comprehensions and like, map, filter, reduce. But but this one is, I think, is the, the fastest one of, of these. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, so I think you're done.